Thank you to our music team for leading us. Uh, that song right there, that was so good as we are reminded of our salvation and what Christ has done for us. And so I trust that in your heart as a believer that you are just celebrating um, all that we have in Christ and who he is on our behalf and all things related to him. I think that it, it does our heart good to look to him in that way. I want to say thank you to those who have uh, stood in this spot the last few weeks as I have uh, uh, still been around at points uh, but uh, had a lighter load and then uh, Kelly and I were able to go away for a few days there a, a week ago and that was, that was very helpful for us as well. And uh, so just thank you for those that helped out in various ways. And we are gifted with a number of individuals, very capable, and uh, just uh, what a blessing it is. And um, I was at a funeral yesterday, and I was bragging about our church here a little bit as we were just talking about um, some of the things that we're uh, doing and a part of, and it was just a good reminder um, how blessed we are as a church body. The uh, funeral that we were at, um, so our daughter-in-law, Hannah, her grandfather passed away, and uh, we were able to go down to Cambridge for that funeral. It was a wonderful uh, testimony of his faith and legacy, and uh, uh, some cool connections, one of them weird, really weird, but um, Hannah's grandparents sang at my parents' wedding. Um, 50 some years ago and and of course uh, never knowing that our paths would cross as Hannah uh, became one of our our family and so uh, pretty neat to just today in relation to that shall we get into the word I think it is time the little book of Titus uh, let's let's try and find that so some of you are are wondering how can I find that little book and and that's okay um, let's try starting at the beginning of the New Testament, and if you uh, can, can say the books of the New Testament by memory, let's see if we can walk our way up to Titus, okay? So you can say it with me, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus. Good job. Well done. And one, you, you have to, as you're learning the books of the Bible, um, you, you figure out little, little things that are going to help you. And one of the things that's helped me uh, to know where Titus is, you noticed we got to uh, those books that begin with T. So 1st first, first and 2nd Thessalonians, then First and Second Timothy, and then Titus. So all that, all those that begin with T. Well, we started with the longest ones, Thessalonians, and then we moved to a little shorter one, Timothy, and then we moved to the shortest word, Titus, and and um, that is just in my mind what helps me to to figure that out. And if you are still learning the books of the Bible, that's okay. That's great. Uh, we're all learning uh, various things. Uh, uh, some of us rattled off those uh, New Testament books pretty easy, but if I'd asked us to do the Old Testament, it would have been a little trickier for some, right? And, and yet, uh, that's good for us to learn as well. So what are we doing in this little book of Titus? Well, we're going to spend the next number of weeks uh, looking at uh, this little book and trying to understand a number of the themes that are here, a number of the things that are, are spoken of. And I, I think that you will notice that there are a number of themes that are going to jump out at us, and, and one of them being this one right here, uh, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. And there's a number of things that, that uh, are repeated in the book. We're going to look at some of those themes in a moment. But this theme of good works is, is probably the one that rises to the top, that we see uh, repeated over and over again. 
in this little book. And so we will be talking a, a fair bit about good works and, and learning them and devoting ourselves to them and maybe even defining them if we need some help in that particular category. Uh, so that's a little bit of what we're going to do. So my goal today is not so much to begin to dissect each paragraph or each section. We will uh, begin that starting next week, but more as an overview to look at some of these bigger themes that are there, and then we'll look at some specific verses related to that. So before we go any further, let's just ask God to lead us, shall we? Heavenly Father, in these moments then, we ask your Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to guide us into understanding these wonderful truths that are here in your word. Lord, we submit ourselves to you as we would seek to uh, be taught by you today. And so thank you for uh, bringing us together. Thank you for um, the open word in front of us. And I pray that it would sink deep within our hearts and our minds today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, there are some individuals that are key in this book and will help us as we understand, uh, as we work our way down through it. So it was written by the Apostle Paul. And what do we know about the Apostle Paul? Well, we know that he was one who initially was actually a, a persecutor of Christians he went by the name of Saul in those days, and uh, his, um, his purpose was really to make it very difficult for believers to worship and to follow Jesus. But he, he met Jesus. Uh, God spoke to him, and uh, he met Jesus Christ, and, and he was radically changed by him and uh, set on a new path. And so we now know him as the Apostle Paul, one who was uh, an, an evangelist, one who was an apologist or, or making a defense for the faith, uh, one who was a church planter, um, one who was an encourager of believers and many, many roles that the Apostle Paul um, uh, had. And so he writes this little book. And, and we observe um, that he was writing it to this guy by the name of Titus. Uh, what do we know about Titus? Well, he was a Greek, so a non-Jewish individual, a, a Gentile, uh, led to the Lord by Paul, and then he became a helper in, in ministry. As Paul would go here and there, uh, proclaiming the good news, then uh, he would bring others along with him at various points, and uh, Titus was one of those individuals. And then God uh, had it; God arranged it so that Titus would become a leader in his own right, and and uh, was left behind in this particular place to continue to develop leaders and to grow the church and to be involved in, in pastoral ministry. And so as, as Paul writes to Titus here, he's, he's looking at it from a leadership perspective and uh, kind of telling Titus what he needs to share with the people and how he needs to lead them and so forth. And so we've got uh, this little book written by Paul uh, to this leader in the church. Uh, his name is Titus. And we've got one other individual to mention here. Uh, through God the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't just come up with these things on his own. He, he didn't just uh, uh, think to himself what would be helpful in Titus' situation. Certainly his human thoughts and personality are certainly a part of the package but the other significant individual that is involved in all of Scripture is the Holy Spirit of God. Um, all Scripture, we are told, is inspired or breathed out by God, given to us for very significant purposes. And so even though we read, you know, that this is a letter of Paul and it's written to Titus, we need to understand as we look at it that it's really God speaking to our hearts even today 
that uh, there was a, a specific context that it was written to, but because God, the Holy Spirit, is very much at work in our lives today, this has direct application for us as well. And so we can be thankful for that. Uh, what's the where in this? Uh, well, it, the, the setting is this island of Crete where Titus is. So Paul is in a different location. There's some discussion about where he would have been uh, when he wrote it. But it is uh, uh, written to Titus who is located on the island of Crete. Uh, I'm told that Crete is the fourth largest island of the Mediterranean and that uh, Paul and Titus had ministered there together for a time. And then, as I said, Paul went on to another place and left Titus there to strengthen the work. And so that's what brings us uh, to where we are. And the when, uh, well... About 62 to 64 A.D. in the year of our Lord. And when, when that was actually put, we would say pen to paper, um, uh, uh, paper to, or pen to parchment or, or something of that nature. And we have uh, a time frame there. Okay, so that's just some of the details that give us a bit of the context of when this happens. So now, let's look at some of the themes that show up in this particular little letter. And so there are four themes that I'd like us just to catch quickly and, and be able to think about. And again, these are things that we'll be unpacking later on, uh, but I want us to kind of see them uh, as they show up in the book here. So first off would be the theme of salvation through Christ. That's pretty much the theme of all of Scripture, really. But you see some specific mentions here. So come with me on a little bit of a journey as we just uh, uh, look at a few of these verses that point to some specific things. So verse 4 of chapter 1. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. So we just noticed the mention there of Savior. Now, if you were to, uh, to look at that on its own, you say, well, it, it doesn't say a whole lot. But when you begin to add that up uh, with the other mentions in the book, you begin to see, oh, this is, this is a theme that is rising up uh, very strongly here. So just notice how he refers to Jesus in that little verse. He refers to him as our Savior. And when we speak of salvation, the idea being that of, of being saved from our sin, being saved to Christ, set apart to him, being rescued from our lostness, and then our foundness being in him, in Christ. He is our Savior. The songs that we sing speak of that very fact as well. Then if you were to go uh, on, come into chapter 2, beginning at verse 10. Chapter 2 and beginning at verse 10. Um, and again, this is uh, 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 starting partway through, but let me just catch verse 10. Not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So there again, a mention of him being our Savior, but let's keep reading, because it describes the gospel here. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us, another good gospel word there, from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So just, just kind of look those verses over again that we've just read there, and, and you'll notice that it starts off with, with our sinfulness as we are reminded that we needed the grace of God to come to us 
And so God brought that to us through Christ and then uh, it changed us, transformed us, redeemed us in order that we might live for him. So do you, do you see the progression that there, there is a need for salvation, then we receive that salvation through Christ, and then we are trained to grow in him, to live out uh, the good works that he's called us to. We'll be talking more about good works in a moment. But this is the gospel in a nutshell, and you see it not only relates to this present age that we are living in, as verse 12 talks about, but the age that is to come, as verse 13 points out, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we are waiting for him to return. And so this covers it all from, from beginning to end there, that the beauty of, of this hope that we have in Christ is for now, and it affects how we live now, but it is also for that which is to come, the life that which is to come. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, before we leave this thought, then quickly, uh, chapter 3 and verse 4. Chapter 3 and verse 4, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Wow, once again, just full of words that relate to the gospel as Jesus is referred to as our Savior, uh, we are justified by his grace. We're, we're given eternal life. All of these words so significant for us and helpful in understanding the gospel. So I hope that I have demonstrated that this little book of Titus is very clearly about uh, referring to our salvation and who we are in Christ in that. And so salvation through Christ, a very prominent theme. What's another one? Well, the whole idea of teaching and learning. So let's again, and, and you'll see we're just kind of going through some of these verses from a different angle now, but look at chapter 1 and verse 9, and what, what do you notice about that? Well, it tells us, and he must hold firm to the trustworthy word, so it's talking about leaders uh, within the church. He, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, what, what do you notice? Well, he's, he's taught something. He's taught the, the word of God, the truth of God, the doctrine of God, as we've heard. And now he needs to know it well, uh, hold firm to it, so that... He can say, look at how much I know. No. So that he may be able to give instruction. So that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and correct those who are opposed to it. Okay, so they're, they're, you're taught so that you can teach is, is very much the idea. Let's just look at another example of this in chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women uh, to love their husbands and children, and so on and so forth it goes, right? They are to teach and train so that others will learn. And that shows up over and over again in this little book. So as Paul writes to, Tim, to Titus, he says to him that there are some things you need to teach the people. And one of the things is you're, you're not the only one who does the teaching, Titus. You, you've got others around you. You've got older men who will teach younger men. You've got older women who will teach younger women. 
You've got leaders who will communicate and others who will learn and grow in that. And so this pattern of teaching and learning, of you know, really going to school, being a part of, of, of this learning process and being trained in the things of God is very much a theme that shows up here. And I would simply say to us, not only do we see salvation through Christ as fundamental to who we are as believers, uh, but we also see this model of teaching and learning and growing to be so important to who we are as a local church body. One of the things I'm so thrilled with is, is that environment that I see right within us here at Rock Mill. So... Um, we, we don't hold tightly to these positions of teaching. You know, what, what Ron has um, talked about in relation to having other young guys do some teaching in Sunday school, that's just a prime example of this model that we, want to, we all want to grow and we all want to learn. Uh, some of you are doing that on Tuesday nights as we gather with some of the newer believers and, and just work through some things there. And it's a learning environment. Uh, we, we want to be able to learn and grow. I like it when I see uh, individuals even back in the sound booth that are learning new uh, techniques. They're, they're learning the job of, of how the sound works here on Sundays. And so th that's a, a learning environment. Some of you downstairs in nursery and junior church and, and Sunday school and all kinds of ways for us to learn and grow and serve. Now, one of the things that so often comes up, a person doesn't feel qualified or I, I really can't do that. I'm just, I'm just not equipped for that. And and while certainly we all have various gifts and abilities and we need to be operating within that for sure, that's, that's scriptural as well. The idea that we have to learn how to do something perfectly before we can serve in that way would keep us from serving forever because no matter how long you're doing it, you're never going to do it perfectly. You know, it would be like me as a dad saying to one of my kids, these are the keys to the vehicle, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna get them until you learn to drive. And uh, my children being smart like they are, they say, well, Dad, how am I gonna learn to drive if we never do this? You have to get behind the wheel. You have to turn the key. You have to put it in gear. You have to actually learn how that works. And, and um, those of you who have taught a beginning driver, uh, you know it can be a little scary at times, but you also know that th that's the way they learn, time behind the wheel. And so how, how are we to learn how to function as a believer? Well, we learn by, by being involved in the things that God has for us. And, and I don't think it's unrelated that that theme of good works and the theme of teaching and learning that they're both together in this little book. I think that that's deliberate. You don't automatically uh, learn. There's work involved. There's training. There's mistakes. There's patience and so on and so forth. But I am thankful for the environment we have here, and I want that to continue. And I know that we as a leadership talk about that quite often in terms of the leadership development, in terms of uh, an internship that we're starting with Elias in the fall. Looking forward to that. All of these are, are various ways to be a part of this process. Okay. Uh, number three here would be godly character development. So on the one hand, it is the, the communication of the truth and the learning of that, but it is all wrapped up in, in character development. And so this goes very closely with the point that we just touched on. Let's just notice a couple of things. I won't spend too long here uh, because we will be unpacking these, as I said, later on. Chapter 2, beginning... At, uh, at verse 2 there, some of it we've already read, but what is it that's being taught? Well, for example, in verse 4, train the young women to 
love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, to be pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the, the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, they urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Uh, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works in your teaching. Show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, and so on and so forth. Now, um, so the skills are, are important, but there's more than skill that's being taught here. Uh, for example, um, self-control comes up over and over again. Uh, how we're to be loving with one another, how we're to be um, growing in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so you may say, well, I can do this skill, and that's wonderful, but God is also concerned about the character development. So not just doing the skill, but how the manner in which we would actually go about that. And uh, is there a sense of humility? Is there a sense of teachableness? Is there a sense of love and patience and kindness toward others? Or are we just going to get the job done, right? You see the distinction between those two things. So godly character development. The last one that we will mention here is the theme of good works, which you've already heard repeated a number of times. Uh, let's just notice a couple of places again where that shows up. So chapter 2 and verse 14. Chapter 2 and verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Okay? Zealous for good works. Chapter 3 and verse 8, the saying is trustworthy and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God, so there's the faith in Christ, may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. And, and so forth. So the idea that God saves us uh, in order that we may then be involved in these good works. And, and a, a, what is a good work? It's simply a, a work that is done for the glory of God that is what he's called us to do. It could be anything from uh, framing a house to changing a diaper, uh, to a cup of coffee with someone, but the idea being that, that it is what God has called us to and equipped us for, and it's a way for us to serve Him. Now, sometimes as believers, we are almost scared to talk about good works, and some of you know exactly why, because it's easy for people to get confused to think that those good works that we do earn us favor with God. The more good things we do, the more God, in a sense, pats us on the back and says, well, now, finally, you've done enough good things. Now I'll be able to let you into heaven. Now I will accept you. That is totally backwards. That is wrong theology. And yet so often we hear it, even in our own minds even in our own heart at times. The good news is that Jesus saves us not because of any work that we have done. And, and if you need a reminder, chapter 3 and verse 5, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. Okay, so your good efforts will not save you. They will not make you uh, acceptable to God. However, we fall upon the mercy of Christ, and He accepts us as we are, and then He equips us to be able to accomplish good works for His glory, for His purposes. And so the kind of good works that we're talking about in this little book are not that which gain us salvation, but because we already have salvation, we are blessed to be able to go forward. And so very quickly, one quote that I want to read to you. 
The gospel encourages me to rest in my righteous standing with God, a standing which Christ himself has accomplished and always maintains for me. I never have to do a moment's labor to gain or maintain my justified status before God. Freed from the burden of such a task, I now can put my energies into enjoying God, pursuing holiness, and ministering God's amazing grace to others. In other words, good works. That's why scripture is over and over again reminding us of a verse that uh, for those that have been a part of our Tuesday night small group, we've, we hit this verse quite a bit. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's the beautiful reminder uh, that God has created us to accomplish his will those things that he has for us, not to gain his favor, but because we are so blessed already in him. So I want to encourage you today, in what way are you learning and growing? As we have looked at the various uh, themes that run throughout this book, in what way is God prompting you, and in what way do you see that there is a need to grow? Well, hopefully we'll be able to address some of those things in the weeks ahead as we take time. Do do you need to be encouraged further in your salvation in Christ? And do you need to be involved in that learning process as a student of God's Word? What character traits is God developing in you at this moment? Or what are some of the good things that you know God would have you to be a part of? All of these Good questions for us to ask. Well, let's pray, and then we transition to communion. Heavenly Father, we ask you to use your word to guide us and to lead us. We thank you that the work that you have begun, this this good work that you have begun in our lives, we know that that will be continued until the day of Christ, and we praise you for that. May we be encouraged in you today. In Jesus' name, amen.